Lord, we pray for Pastor Gary and the team as they go to Vietnam, Cambodia, Cambodia and Thailand. Your Holy Spirit to guide them, keep them, inspire them, protect them, inform them, motivate them. Uh, they would open their mouths and you would fill it that hearers, people would hear the word of life, holding forth the word of life with the tongue of the learned, we ask. And then here in Baltimore this summer, Father, in our homes, anoint our home with life and joy and peace, our things, our possessions, our purposes, that godliness would be at the very heart of our lives, unity with you, unity with each other, wisdom from above, godliness in the heart, words of life in our homes, in our cars, keep us from uh, water accidents, car accidents, buses. Keep us from the paths of the destroyer. Keep us in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Uh, anoint our lives with a special blessing because we are your people. And then open our mouths so we would propagate, we would counsel we would advise, we would inspire, we would share our lives with joy. Lord, in Christ's name, and not just in Baltimore, but worldwide, every believer, everywhere, and bring a, a revival in our country, turn many to you, many prayer meetings, many, many people seeking and finding and answer in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Good morning. We have had a great time here at Greater Grace with all the different preachers and uh, pastors that have been sharing and preaching, and I've heard. And uh, praise God, glory to God for the content and the spiritual vitality uh, that is in the church, that is in our church, and we pray everywhere. Uh, today we are recognizing, or we have an open house at our Bible college. You have a paper, every other seat. Uh, that means that you're welcome to come to that evening and check it out, uh, sign up for a class or two or the whole thing. Maybe go to the whole thing, uh, four years of Bible college and be a missionary in Vietnam, and plan a church, and counsel, and establish a headquarters, and reach Vietnam and the whole region. Why not? You cannot limit God. Yes, we can in our unbelief, but why limit the Most High, the Holy One of Israel? And um, the psalmist said that, limiting the Holy One of Israel. Uh, but we can believe him. And many of us, by God's grace, have seen that happen. Uh, I may not be the leader, but I am a team member. Uh, I may not be a leader, but I am a supporter. I may not be a leader, but I may live in Baltimore, and I am praying. I'm giving. I'm serving. I'm part of it, like Pastor Gary said. Uh, today we are speaking about the tongue, so I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 7, and this is in our series. Uh, we have started with the ears, we have spoken about the feet and the hands uh, through the last weeks, and now we are on the tongue. The tongue is a little member, unruly, who can tame it. We all know about the power of the tongue because we've been a victim of its uh, power. We have made major decisions because of what somebody said about us or 
somebody said that might have hurt us or contrarily encouraged us. How many have been on a football team and your coach was behind you and supported you and pushed you and made you perform beyond what you thought you ever could do because of the tongue? How many of you have been devastated by something somebody said to you? It may be a friend, a wife, a husband, a teenager, a child, a teacher, a professor, a leader, a manager, a pastor. And those words were sharp. You went to bed thinking about them. And I dare say there are elderly people today that remember that when they were 12 years old, that their father said to them devastating words. Well, it's such a big subject. I was in the grocery store. I saw a couple of years ago a little book at the counter, you know, those little Christian book. This was a Christian book stand in the grocery store, and it was entitled Taming Your Tongue, 30 Days to Tame Your Tongue. <laughs> Great title, I took it, bought it, read it, reread it, read it again. Recently, yes, last night, I went through it again, read it again, good little book, and uh, I recommend that to you. You can probably find a copy. In this portion, Mark chapter seven, Christ speaks about two things regarding the, let's see, we could draw a picture this way. Here's a man and his body, he has a mouth. Food is one of the systems of his body. Food goes in the mouth, it goes in the mouth. And Jesus said, what does it, what does it where does it go? Out. In the draught, that's a word for toilet, which in some places is a vulgar word, by the way. I, don't, I usually don't use it, but anyway, sorry if I offended you. You'll get over it. <laughs> so system number two. What is system number two? Mouth and Breathing, great, really. Water, okay, breathing, words, okay, words. We'll see this in a second. Where do they come from? Not your stomach, they come from your heart. And do they go, where do they go? Out. Do you realize what I just drew is what Jesus just said here in Mark chapter 7. Read it with me. Verse 18. He said unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without enters into the man, it cannot defile him? Hold it. Slow down. What is he saying? Jewish people don't, cannot eat shrimp. How many like shrimp? Come on, what's wrong with shrimp? Christ said, shrimp cannot defile you. Come on, Jesus, you are Jewish. We are Jewish. You know we cannot eat shrimp. It'll make us unclean. It's an unclean food. Or pork. Christ is saying no. Now he has a, now he has a, a word regarding Jewish law. But behind his conversation and where he's going is that you think food is what this religion is all about. 
But I'm telling you, words are really at the heart of where we live. Not the shrimp, the words. What comes out of your mouth, that's what I'm talking about. So let's go to the next verse. Verse 19. Because it enters not into his heart, the shrimp does not enter into his heart, but into the belly and goes out into the draw, the latrine, into the pit, into the gutter, into the trench, purging all meats. Verse 20, and he said, that which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. There it is. What comes out of the man defiles the man. Hold it. What? What comes out of your mouth defiles the man. That's what, that affects you. If you are cursing, it affects you. That defiles you. If you are argumentative, and there are some families where they grow up, the children grow up in an argumentative home. Mom and dad are always arguing. And even it gets beyond reason. It's not even reasonable. They just seem to be enjoy the, the argument and the tension and the emotion. A hurricane. I read recently there are two strong things, a hurricane and a rock. And some people, they live in the strength of a hurricane and not in the strength of a rock. What's the difference? A hurricane is moving. A hurricane is powerful. Hurricane is destructive. Hurricane is on the move. There's a lot of energy in it but it's not very stable. You can't build on a hurricane. It's a power that is uh, not a good power, but a rock is another kind of power and strength. And there are people that with their tongue, they create a hurricane because they like the energy, the um, confusion, the power, the influence, but it's very destructive. Another kind of tongue is not a hurricane tongue, but it is a rock tongue. Okay. So, verse 20. That which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries. Now, in this list of 13 items, I think we could park at every one of them and talk about the tongue. Because out of this heart that Christ is using here in this uh, chapter with the 13 things, none of the 13 things are good. All of them are are wrong. All of them are sinful. All of them are destructive. All 13 of them. And there are people who have skillful tongues who have adultery in their heart, but they use words to express the same idea or be flirtatious or suggestive or cute or coy, deceitful, tricky, but it's coming from the same sinful heart. Uh, would you look at the list with me? I know some of you don't want to listen to this this morning. Well, it's tough. You got to listen to it. You're here, and it's too embarrassing to get up and walk out right now, so you got to sit here and take it, and you need it. You don't have an arrogant attitude, but trust God. It's going to get good. It's going to be edifying. You get over it. Look at chapter 7, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. A 
A lying tongue. I have a short list here. A lying tongue. I tell a half-truth. I exaggerate. Uh, a boastful tongue. Sometimes we're with people, and if you say something, they always up you in the conversation. I, I bought a new used car. I bought a new car. I bought a new car. I bought two new cars. I went on a trip to Ohio. I went to California. Well, I went to California. Why well, I went to Mexico. Well, I went to Mexico. I went to the moon. <laughs> There's the tongue that is argumentative, as I mentioned. They feed on it. This is not a good kind. There's the argument and debate and the healthy fleshing out. I, I, there is something I want to mention here before I get into this, because I know of all the things that say there's a lot that can be left out. But I want to say one of the things that people do when they realize they have a tongue problem is that they go to silence and they have a tongue fast. <laughs> and this is brought out in that little book I referred to. The woman realized I have a tongue problem and she decided not to talk. <laughs> and there is something, si silence is golden. We've heard that proverb. I don't think it's in the Bible, but it's a good one. Silence is golden, but speech is vital. Speech is important. There is a portion in Numbers 30 where when a woman is making a vow and the man in her, in her life, and it may be her father, if she's not married, it's her father, and it could be her husband if she's married, it is her husband. And she makes a vow. And the father has to cancel the vow or agree with the vow. It's an awesome principle. He cannot be silent. Let me repeat it. I wish we could turn there and take some time, but again, this is, we'll, you know. I'm trying to get a lot in little, so I, 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 this could be, we could go, go there. It's just awesome. Okay, listen. A woman says something. She makes a vow. The man, of the, the man in her life is there listening, and he says, no, that's not, I, we can't, that's, I don't agree. The vow is canceled by the man. Awesome. Many men are silent when they should be speaking. Many men are critical in life, in the world, in God. Many men are important as women. I don't mean there's no difference in one sense, but what I'm saying is men have a propensity for silence when they should be engaged and confrontational and vet it out, flesh it out, understand what's going on because silence is not the pro silence is not the solution for your tongue problem. The heart is the solution for the tongue problem. This is where the heart has to be affected by God. You cannot you cannot bail out. And I, and I have that in my nature. I tend to, I can be, I just can withdraw, be, calm, be quiet when it's timely and it's important to be engaged and heads up, realize what's going on because that person just made a vow and I, gotta, I should be canceling it. But if I'm silent about it, then it goes on and it may be a mistake. Case in point, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When she was listening to the devil, where was the guy? He was supposed to be there. When Jesus came here, he was in those situations. He knew when to be quiet, and he didn't have a fleshly tongue, that is a tongue that is of the flesh, 
but he had an engaging one with the enemy. He also knew where to be, what to say. He was a great teacher, obviously, and he was in investing and making a difference with his tongue. Isaiah 50, verse 4, a tongue, the tongue of the learned. Now, the word learned, the tongue of a disciple, the tongue of a person who is habitually learning the right stuff. Let's go back to the problem here. Here's our heart. There's two people in you. There's two. There's the heart that is that has got a hole in it. It's defiled out of our mouth comes adulteries. Oh yeah, what a big joke it is at work. Adultery, what a boasting. Adultery, fornications. How many people are are just propagating out of their mouth these things? Murders, I hate him. I hate him. Have you ever thought of killing somebody? Ha, ha, ha. You're sitting there, no, not me. Oh, yeah, sure. If you have hated somebody or wish they would die, okay, this is out of your heart. If you've said it out of your mouth, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy. How much swearing goes on every day? Pride and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So there's the man, and there we are. What happened with us was our new birth, and God gave us a new heart. Now we have a heart that is the heart of David, the heart after God, a man after God's own heart. Well, how did I get a heart like David's heart? Christ gave it to you. Well, how did I get a heart after God? Christ gave it to you. Where do you think it came from? Your mom and dad? No, the one from your mom and dad came over here. That's the one from your mom and dad. And that's the one that you've given your children and your grandchildren. Where did the new heart come from? came from God being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. That heart has different speech. That heart has different content. Do you talk about adultery, theft, lying, deceit? Are you talking dirty jokes and, and swearing and cussing and cursing and wishing people would be destroyed deep in your heart? No, actually, I'm quite surprised with myself. I'm doing a pretty good job. Yeah. Well, I am. Well, where'd that come from? Huh? Where? Go ahead, now, you, you, now you're scared of me. <laughs> where, where? Came from God by his grace, by his Holy Spirit. Amazing. But I got to tell you something. If you grew up in a home where you were always fighting and swearing and cussing and throwing things, you cannot be that way today. And you say, my parents were like that and that's the way I am. No, that isn't the way you are. You have changed. You've been changed. You don't talk like that at, in the house anymore. You don't talk like that. You're different. Glad it's Psalm 34, verse 2. I, uh, we have praises that come out of our mouth all the day long. We now have another speech. We have uh, edification. We, we look we look at things like the potential. There's actually joy. There's actually, actually appreciation. There's beauty. Uh, there, there are things we listen to that we enjoy. We, we have a spirit of, that is the Holy Spirit. 
the spirit of love and joy and peace, the spirit of God. But we know we find ourselves like our mother or like our father. I remember <laughs> we all say, we, you know, when you're young, you think, okay, I'm not going to grow up to be like my mother, okay? I'm not going to be, and then you find out one day, oh my, even the picture looks the same. <laughs> even the attitude, even the words I'm saying, I'm my mother reincarnated. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, good question. Are you, you know, what I believe, it takes some teaching, it takes some understanding, I believe it takes some effort, I believe it takes some awareness, and I believe it takes some deciding power, and I believe it's something I do on purpose, and I believe that I learn how to do it, and I believe that the people I hang out with and the kind of conversation that I have. Okay, let's have a prayer for me right now. You saw I went over the edge, didn't I? Okay. You saw that. You witnessed it. It's on the video. Okay. Now, I'm serious about it. I don't know that if I make it force, if I say it forcefully enough, I do not know that if you are getting the message that people I hang out with, the things that I listen to goes into my heart, I digest it, and it comes out of my mouth. It does. Garbage in, garbage out. Sure it does. You, you got to decide. And you, come to, you come to the church and you have fellowship and you have some new friends and you have some good conversations and you learn how to speak and how to be quiet and how to edify and you learn how to be this way. Now, I want to show you a couple. There's a few like little humorous things. Turn to Ju Judges 16. And I just want you to see Delilah and a female at her height of manipulation. Verse 15, Judges 16, 15. And she said unto him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Mm. Was she good at that or what? I mean, if you read the story, she is, a, she is awesome at this thing. She's a beautiful woman. This was his problem, right? Samson. Man of God from birth. No, a man of God from birth. His mother dedicated him to Christ at his birth. And he had the long hair and he was, took the Nazarite vow and he was a anointed man of God, but the, the, the nature of the man, he had a propensity for these kind of women. This was Philistine woman, and she was able to manipulate him. How can you say you love me if you don't have sex with me? I don't have sex with anybody. I'm going to have sex with my wife when I get married to her, and it probably isn't going to be you after all. Manipulation? I want to live with a manipulator. How can you say you love me if you don't buy me that brand new car? How can you say you love me if you don't do what I say? How can you say you love me if you cannot? These are tongues, a power and influence in our everyday life. Have you heard it? Can you discern it? Do you recognize it? Do you know what a healthy tongue is? Do you know what it is when there is a tongue that is godly? Do you know, can you hear it? Does it affect you when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you're saying, that's it, that's what I want. I want that. That'll make me a wise man, and I need wisdom. Look at back to this, this one here. The silent man may not be wise. He said, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to get in any trouble. I'm just going to be quiet. And 
Okay. I got this funny thing here. This woman uh, beating up on women, I think. Here, let me get it. Hmm. I don't have it. Okay. Okay, forget it. <laughs> Later, maybe. Maybe tonight, I, if I can. Okay. Ah. So. I have a tongue problem. James chapter 3. Turn there with me. We'll finish up. I think we made some good points this morning. There's a lot more to say. And James 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing we'll receive the greater condemnation, meaning many teachers where you have a greater responsibility. But be a teacher. People need it. Learn, learn your material and be a teacher and have an influence on your friends and give an opinion. I had a great conversation with a young man coming from Europe. I was very impressed with him. And um, uh, he, he had a lot of things he's thinking about and what's going on, and I just enjoyed it. And he gave me his card when we landed. He said, please contact me. I'd love to talk to you again. So I hope that will be happening. There are people that are wanting to meet you. There are people that want to know what is your opinion. What, is, what do you have to say about the politics of the day? What do you have to say about dishonesty? adultery? What do you have to say about abortion? What do you have to say about same-sex marriage? What is your opinion on things? The election coming up and so on. We are, we don't know, we're not know-it-alls. There are people that have tongues that are, they don't know what they're, they have a know-it-all type of thing. Proverbs 12, verse 23. Uh, some are complaining all the time. No, we are not that way. Psalm 142. Sometimes we retaliate with our tongue. We get back at somebody, 1 Peter 3, 9. No, we do not retaliate. If somebody mistreats you, just be quiet. You don't retaliate. They throw you a missile, don't throw a missile back. They stab you with a sword, do not stab them back. You, you have honor by not doing it and learning how to be wise how to be edifying, how to be loving, how to avoid the enemy in some cases, and then never be accusing, Revelation 12, 10. Don't be an accusing tongue, and accusing the brethren, accusing people, and blaming them. They may be guilty, but it's not your place to be accusatory. And as a way, sometimes people accuse others to protect themselves and defend themselves. Then there is the loquacious tongue, the person that is talking all the time, Proverbs 10 and verse 19. One woman went to the doctor with her husband, and the woman and the man were in the room, and the doctor is asking the man the questions, the woman is answering them all. And he realizes, so he asks someone to step out in the waiting room. Then he comes in, the doctor comes in, asks the man questions, and he can't speak. He calls the woman back in and says that he has a problem, he, he can't speak, and she's like, I didn't know that. <laughs> How could you not know that? Because she's not listening to him. She's doing all the talking, all the time. Oh, no. This new heart. Ooh, this is amazing. Heart to heart. That's awesome. Do you hear me? Like we can say in our 
talk and our connection with people. Are we being heard? Yes, when that happens and there's a uh, relationship and when the Holy Spirit is between us, it is so, it is so touching when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. When the, when the Acts came and the Pentecost came, it was the tongues of fire. It was a different tongue. It was the spiritual tongue. I'm amazed that we were in, living in Hungary and there was this hyper spiritual movement in Hungary uh, known as the Faith Church. And, and some of the people would come to our church and I would get to know them a little bit and they would talk and they, on one hand, love the Pentecostalism and the charismatic elements, but then they got hurt by how they talked and gossiped, slandered, accused each other outside of the church. How can I say praise God in the church and then go out in the parking lot and speak evil of my brother? These things my brethren ought not to be in James chapter 3. Because if I'm really spirit-filled, it will affect my language. If I'm actually spirit-filled, it will affect my relationships. They will be normal, edifying, spiritual, loving, humility will be there. Okay, that's about it. But go to James 3 just because I want to show you one thing because, you know, I'm long-winded. Verse 2, many things we offend all. And this means habitually. Many things, often, over and over again, we are offending others. We are hurting others. How often? Actually, it says here, many ways and repetitively we offend. And if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, a mature man, able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm. In the Greek, it means very, very small helm. And in the ancient world, the uh, rudder on the ships, there were two on the sides in the back of the stern of the ship, and they were small paddles. And the tongue is a little member, but it is so powerful. And then it goes on, but I think we will do that. I just want to show you this, if we can go back to this. And which one was it, Pastor Steve? The fat pad. Okay, thank you. There is the sail of, is it up on the screen? The, the rope, when the tension, the tension on the sail, this is interesting, it's brought out in the, in the Greek, you know, in the, in the, I'm not a Greek guy, this, in the, in the, but I read this and believe the scholars know what they're talking about, that the tongue is like a part of the tension between the sail and the, the ship. It's that rope that goes to the sail. And the tension, the holding power, that tension on the sail is that piece of rope that goes to the sail and this is a, the word used here in verse 3, that we put bits in the horse's mouth. And the commentary that I had was that this also refers to that rope on the sail where you have the tension. And the tongue, I, I think it's a good illustration because I can feel in my tongue there are times when I say something and I can feel the force of what I say. If I, I say I should be silent, I don't have anything to say, I shouldn't be silent, I should be silent. I'm able to control that. I will be silent. I will not say 
what I would like to say. I'm not going to say it. There is tension there. And in our conversations and in our everyday life, there, there is a force with our tongue that we must control it. We must tame it. And you just are there almost like, I can't, I'm not going to say it. There are things in your married life and your family life, you should never say them. You should never say them. There are things at your workplace, you should never say them. And with the opposite sex also, you should never say them. You are not to do flit. You're not to give you flattery. You're not to be manipulative. You're, there are location, loquacious, you know, you know, speaking all the time, all the time. You get, you get the tension. And you say, my, my mouth, I'd like to say it, but I'm not. I tame. God has given me a new heart, and I've learned to tame my tongue. You get it? I learn, I have tamed my tongue. Ah, I love it. I love this church because we can say these things. I love this Bible because it teaches us this stuff. I love this place because I cannot go to the local high school. They will never say these things. You cannot go to a local bar room. They will never say these things. You cannot go to the local university in a classroom. They, they pr probably they would, they would love to. And they could say them in a sense because education, okay, education and professionalism is where is approaching that sensible and civil, and that's the kind of world that I want to live in, but I, want, I don't want to live in an artificial one. I want to live in the reality of one. And when something's wrong, I believe that you should be able to say it. If something is offensive, and it's not politically correct, but it is, a, it is offensive. I believe I have a right to say it because, it because I want to be saying something that means something that's from God's heart and God's mind. I'm not deliberately combative, but I am offensive because Christ was like that. And I'm not deliberately offensive. I just am at times because this will happen because we are spirit-filled believers that have an opinion and a mind on something that needs to be said. Okay, last thing. They took prayer out of our schools, you know, the high schools, you know, back in whatever, 72 or Pastor Steve, you know, 63. Okay. Why? I don't know, actually, the whole thing. I do not know, but we know generally. Where were the American people? What did they have to say? Maybe they're quiet. Maybe they don't know what to say. Maybe they are indifferent. Well, that's not, hey, I don't, we don't live like that. Not here. I have an opinion about that. Why can't we, why we cannot pray in a public place? Why they can pray in Congress, but they cannot pray in a local high school, and so on. In other words, we have something to say. And don't be just an indifferent pat with a heart that's afraid of getting in trouble and saying things, that's as wrong as saying things that are stupid and silly and foolish and com combative. That's not right either. I'm saying you got a tongue. You have a tongue. You better learn how to use it. And if you don't learn how to use it, people will run over you. And if you don't know how to say and how to be engaged and learn what's going on here, and you don't know how to do it without this book. You don't know how to talk back to the devil without this book. You don't know how to relate to each other without this book. And you and I don't know how to live our life, protect our children, and have a good family life, and keep our marriages together without this kind of book. We need words. Brother and sister, we need words. Not just the words of man. We need words of life. Okay? Amen. Thank God. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> They're just spicy. Hey, got stirred up, right? Hey, that's useful. Pray with me, please. If you're here today and you do not have Jesus in your life, now is the time, not tomorrow. Nuclear war could happen tomorrow. That's a great thought for this morning. <laughs> hey, 
car accident could be happening tomorrow. You don't know about your future. Today is the day. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Christ. Say yes to him. Lord Jesus, I need you. Say, Jesus, I need you. Save me. Come into my life and, and save me. Raise your hand if you're saying the prayer of faith. If you're accepting Christ, we always give an invitation here in this church. We always do it because we're looking for the, the person that's just saying, I, I didn't know about that. I have to decide? Yes, you must decide. I didn't know about that. You mean I, I, it's my choice? Yes. Christ died for you. Now say yes to him. Say yes to him by faith. Jesus' name. Raise your hand, anyone? In Jesus' name. Father, pre please do salvations here. Please save souls, Lord. Please, Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.